Kentucky for the Northampton Police Review Commission. Uh, we will be beginning uh, starting with roll call. Uh, also, this this uh, meeting is being recorded on Zoom, and you can find that on the city's website. Um, yeah. Uh, Noah, do you want to call us in? Yeah. Josie? Here. Dan? Here. <laughs> Sorry, here. <laughs> uh, and Michael? Here. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Awesome. So we're going to start this meeting like we start most of our meetings with, um, let's do the approval of minutes first. So is everyone okay with the approval? With approving yeah. the minutes for last yeah. meeting? Yeah, I would move to approve. That can do it. <laughs> awesome. Noah, you want to count us off? Yeah. Dan? Yes. Josie? Yes. And Michael? Yes. Yay, thank you. <laughs> awesome. So the minutes are approved. Uh, let us continue with our public comment. Uh, we schedule about 30 minutes, but if it's not utilized, we'll just continue to move on. Um, raise your hand and we will, or I will uh, call you out in order that you've raised your hand to make a public comment. Um, so let's start off with uh, Rye Buckley. You have the floor for three minutes. Hello, everybody. Um, it's good to be here, as always. Uh, I just want to make a couple quick comments about last night's meeting. Um, these are some pretty, you know, new thoughts, and hopefully I'll say some of these things again before the full commission next week in a more thought-out way. But I appreciated the discussion of the final report last night. Um, I appreciated Bus Booker asking, you know, targeted questions about the form of the new department, and I really appreciated, Dan, your thoughtful replies. Um, I appreciated Carol talking about Housing First, and I thought the way Carol sort of connected Housing First to the charge of this um, this commission was really, you know, well put. Um, and then I really wanted to, you know, draw attention and, you know, to the way Javier, I think, really articulately talked about how reallocating money away from the police department to another department isn't radical or even unusual and he used analogies of schools and you know other departments and just sort of talked about how if the service is found to be you know better suited to another department the money is moved and you know it's very it's very charged but it's also very normal and i thought the way javier put it was just really great um super appreciate all your hard work um and i'm looking forward to the discussion tonight um Thank you all. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rai. Um, if there's anyone else who would like to make a public comment, now would be the time to raise your hand. Um, otherwise, we as a commission are going to move on to our next order of business. I'll give you a few seconds to decide. No, Robert said in the chat that they're all set. So that takes care of everyone cool. in the audience. Awesome. Love it. So we will move on to uh, our next item on our agenda, was, which is explanation of expenditures and revenue streams from the NPD. <clears throat> so I don't know about right. anyone else, but for for me, this is something that uh, I've very much been wanting to discuss. Uh, I mean, we've done we've done a good deal of talking about where the um, money could go, how we've been thinking about uh, reallocating money for the creation of new institutions, new departments uh, that have a level of accountability just not seen in the police department as we move services away. Um, you know, where does the, uh, I think a really valid question to ask is, is the revenue stream brought in by the police department um, something that we are okay with keeping or discarding? And my argument for discarding it is because it seems like a pretty coercive uh, power that the state or the, the community or the policing has to kind of siphon funds out of 
our citizens uh, knowing full well how some uh, populations are targeted more than others and how those populations tend to be low income, the houseless population, people of color, and it then further kind of perpetuates the cycle of these marginalized communities actually paying extra for these institutions that then go on to oppress them for the purposes of placating and making um, uh, like, you know, higher income people, mostly white people, more comfortable with their current circumstances, which I think is a really valid kind of critique and thought to kind of have in our head as we're thinking about revenue streams that go, that the NPD, I guess, quote unquote, produces, even though it's really a coercive mechanism. I think it's important to note, like, that some of the things that we might say are revenue generating activities are things that we also can't, like, some of those things are things that, like, they're still going to happen within the city, just maybe not within the police department. So thinking about details um, as one, like, and, you know, calling it, like, oh, police details and having detail pay, we can have citizen flaggers or, or civilian flaggers or other people doing those jobs, but those jobs don't suddenly not need to be done. And that still results in revenue for the city. I would love to see that that revenue earmarked, right? That's, that's money that businesses are paying uh, or private organizations or entities. They're paying the city uh, for that. It'd be great to have that money go directly towards what we want. <laughs> Um, in terms of sort of reinvestment, right? If we're saying, oh, we want we want to have a fund for peer um, peer led um, uh, peer led responses uh, or or other things like that, we do need to pe we do need to pay for those, and that's one way to also do some of that. Um, and to to be able to specifically say, look, you're you're going to get money, <laughs> it's and you're just earmarking those funds immediately like just so that they don't get put into the general fund and then get shuffled or disappear. Um, and I think that's something that I took from uh, Karen Foster over the summer um, when she was uh, speaking, saying that, you know, working with large amounts of money and large funds, if things aren't earmarked and protected, uh, you lose them. Uh, they're, they're easy to get lost in that shuffle and then they could be used for something else. So I think really specifying, <laughs> Um, you know, and having having part of the budgetary process be identifying those those funds and where they would go, um, and then I mean we could probably look at the the past couple of years um, to get a general estimate or a trend of what's going on. Um, the other one, are like the fines and forfeitures, which at least in the budget that I that I saw, it's like six hundred and something some odd thousand dollars. Um, but those come from all different, it, it's not just the police department. Um, and the police department's forfeitures, like at least from the documents that we got before, vary pretty widely. Um, and those, that's when we start to get to, if we can curtail <laughs> the police involvement at the start, <laughs> um, then those, those funds sort of dry up. Um, ideally, because it just wouldn't be happening. There wouldn't be civil asset forfeiture, um, especially when there are no charges brought against the person, <laughs> um, which is something that can happen now. Um, so it's a little weird. <laughs> um, in but like, I think finding language where we can really, <sighs> finding language where we can poke at what is a, what we do know is available. Um, and then I think one of the things that, uh, that that we've been trying to do is sort of attribute a dollar amount to the call volume, <laughs> um, which has been very, very difficult. Um, I mean, we can at least get a really, really rough estimate. And I kept plugging away at some of the data. I've still got more to, to go through um, to get like down to sort of the call type. Um, but even then, I think one of the things that gets tricky is like the police 
like the report that they generated for us and that the chief sent like that 2015 to 2019 man hours um part which i'm still converting <laughs> into a nice uh like to, into an excel sheet um but like the things that it that it has those categories don't necessarily like they have a category for medical hyphen mental health um now that's different from a medical health or a medical emergency, a medical overdose, a medical suicide attempt, a mental health outreach. Um, like, <laughs> uh, it doesn't, and then, you know, there's all the other questions of like, um, for unknown, um, for unknown part or unknown or third party, um, a lot of the calls were just to wake up someone. Right. Um, so when the chief sent her response to us, um, when we said, like, what are these what do these categories mean? Like what what gets classified as, you know, traffic control versus um, traffic enforcement versus traffic complaint. Um, and they sent that sort of here's 50 examples of each of the calls. <laughs> um, and for because un unknown third party just stood out to me as a weird one. So I was like, all right, let's start there. Um, but it was like. A person was asleep in the park and they were woken up. A person was asleep on a bench and they were woken up. A person was asleep off of the parking trail and they were working, woken up and moved along. Um, so if we had, and so this is where it gets tricky is there might be some in there that are not those sort of things where we'd want a peer led response or uh, like, it, um, let me phrase that depending on the type of peer-led responses we have, it's a little hard to say, you know, if this group is responding to um, drug-related or substance use, and this group is related to mental health, and here's the number of mental health calls that that group could expect. Here's the number of mental health or substance use calls that this group could expect. The reporting that we have doesn't really help us to predict that very accurately. I mean, we can still do rough, rough estimates. That that's that's something we can do, but um, it just gets a little more difficult. I don't know if, does that make sense? Yeah, no, that that makes yeah. that makes a ton of sense. Um, that being said, in terms of um, you know transferring that kind of that rough dollar amount to the new service uh or institution or infrastructure whatever it may be or whatever it is called uh i still think and maybe i'm in the minority here that even if you were to you know allocate a little more money than mathematically if we had stronger numbers we would recommend i still feel like you know it would be less expensive than having police do that job oh yeah don't, oh yeah don't don't get me wrong <laughs> I, I have said from the beginning, take away responsibility, you also take away money. <laughs> like, right. like, because we're paying for, and you know, this is just sort of framing, right? Like the, the police response, the police got those responsibilities, hefted it onto them, asked for more money so that they could actually do them, right? From disinvestment from other, other um, community investments. When we take, when we put those, or those responsibilities back, we still like those responsibilities come with costs associated with it and they have to have that funding go with them as well. Um, but I think we do want to be careful with the saving money part because I think at the end of the day, all of these things are going to cost the city more money, especially up front. Um, and then you might see returns later on, but this is community investment, right? This is, yeah, we're going to spend money, but it's to make the community better and stronger and work for everybody. So in that sense, I mean, I don't want to say it's going to like totally save money. I think it's just going to be, we're spending it differently. No, look, the, the city of Northampton operates on a $100 million budget. Um, it's going to be a $100 million budget, right? I mean, all the services that the city provides need to be addressed. And, you know, if they're addressed by the police, they're going to cost X. If they're going to be addressed by another department, they're going to cost X. I mean, it, it, those costs associated. So the budget's not going to go down to 90 you know, just because you, you say, oh, we're moving this, it's just not how the budget's gonna work. You still have to pay qualified people to respond. 
to to the various services. I um I spent a few minutes. I wanted to just mention to both of you. I spent a few minutes kind of going through. I, I it's in the other room the the budget uh, proposal that the mayor sent the city council last May, um, and just kind of look specifically at the departments, um, the very you know the various city departments and, and how much they cost um, and how many people are employed and, and what they do, and a couple of them you know stood out to me. Um, you know, senior services, for instance, costs. Um, you know, clo uh, pardon me, no health department. Um, this year was budgeted down, uh, budgeted up quite a bit because of COVID. They hired some ambassadors or liaisons, I guess they're calling them. And so they're, they're you know, the health department is going to cost a little over 500,000. Um, and that comes, that's, um, I believe, at like 11, you know, FTE uh, full times. Uh, so, you know, thinking about what that costs, um, the health to me, like just kind of think about what the health department does, uh, you know, it's probably a higher amount of expense that's not just personnel expenses. You know, like we look at, you look at offices like, you know, for instance, the assessor or the auditor, and you figure most of the money is spent on the people to just do the basic jobs. You know, the money that they spend on the services is probably certifications, um, you know, things of that nature. Whereas the health department is, is doing a lot more outreach uh, and, and certainly with the, with the um, various levels of uh, PPE that they've been handing out and uh, the, the brochures they've created and so forth. I mean, so to me, it looked, I looked at that and thought, this is kind of interesting. 11 people, um, you know, at almost a half a million dollars. Uh, that's an interesting model to think about for uh, a, a, a different department that would have different sort of uh, responsibilities, especially when you start talking about liaisons. Because to me, we have people sitting in front of first churches with a, with a table and some hand sanitizer and masks and rubber gloves. And then sometimes they're at Pulaski Park. So they're, they're in a different place around the city. Um, what if they were up walking around and talking to people in need, talking to people and trying to connect those people with services? I mean, you know, we heard in city council last week from Elliott Homeless Services about a lot of what they do is that they're, they're you know, really out, you know, walking in, you know, camping areas and in, in other places to meet people that are in need and try to connect them with services. But what if the city took some of that responsibility on it? To me, all of a sudden, that that one department kind of clicked for me. Um, so, in terms of the size, scope, and money, yeah, and I think that also gets us to the other part, which is sort of the uh, when it comes to like the cost for staffing. Um, that you know, it doesn't necessarily like we have a reduction in uh, in the police size in, in for that department, um, but still maintain the same level of service and actually maybe even have more service by by focusing those responsibilities. And then, you know, maybe other departments would also be involved. So having the Board of Health involved in uh, health services, substance use, and things like that, and having a, a department that sort of lives under them and has that purview, right? a healthy, uh, and it also gives us the chance <laughs> to touch on race and, and that, because that, I mean, that's part of what got us here <laughs> um, to begin with. And it's not something that we've talked a lot about because it's one of those harder things, but the, sit, or the state of Massachusetts has declared racism a public health crisis, right? So has Northampton. And so, all right. And Northampton has the, um, there's the resolution, there were two resolutions, right? Or am one, I... one, one by the board of health and one by the city council. Yeah. Um, and so, to say, all right, now let's let's take this as an opportunity. So there's another place where that could, um, or another avenue of looking at funding because that frees up funding from the state as well if it's funding that. Um, so a lot of different opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I you know I I was thinking about this last night in the meeting, um, a couple of different things uh, that you've just mentioned. One was. Um, you know, David who had made a comment about being less concerned about where the money comes from and more concerned. And I said this a couple of times to people as well about more concerned about when we create this, making sure that that the city spends the money to fund it. However, they decide, however, the mayor, you know, who, you know, this mayor now and a, and a new mayor next time uh, decides to allocate the money. Uh, just getting these things that we're asking for done is, is very important. I thought that was kind of interesting because most of the calls are obviously to take the money from the 
from the policing budget and put it to put it against these things. But I thought it was interesting that he thought to himself, like, you know, and I had had a similar kind of feeling that it's not um, it's not necessarily about taking the money specifically from the police for some people, as much as it's just about making sure you're funding these services that we're identifying can be done by somebody that doesn't necessarily need to bring a gun into the room. Um, you know, I, I didn't, I wasn't really prepared to talk about this tonight, but I, I do want to mention to you, Dan, I was writing an uh, a, a email to send to you and Cynthia and Josie, I'm so glad to share it with you too. Um, and I'm just gonna, because you brought up the, um, the resolutions. Um, one of the things about the Northampton City Council resolution, and it, it's a resolution in support of actions to combat the public health crisis of systemic racism. It's largely based on the Massachusetts Black and Latino Legislative Caucus proposed 10 point plan to combat systemic racism in policing and police brutality. Uh, you know, in August, I attended an event held by the Western Mass um, Health Equity Network, and it was a, it was a thing specifically for local governments um, on how, how to organize around health equity. Um, and right at that same time was when the, the Board of Health was doing their resolution and then we were working on our resolution. One of the things about the 10 point plan is it includes the state establishing an office. You know, there's in the 10 point plan, if you're not familiar with it, I'll just say it. Uh, the first four items are for the federal government to do, the next four are for the state government, and the last two are for, are for the municipalities to do. Uh, so the Point number six is um, pass an act to reform civil service exams and establish an office of diversity and equal opportunity to establish guidelines and review for diversity plans for all state agencies. So I thought that was kind of interesting, but it doesn't mention that cities should do that. Uh, so I had proposed an amendment to our resolution, the council's resolution saying that we would urge the mayor to establish an office of equity and human rights to promote equity and reduce disparities within city government, provide guidance, education, and technical assistance to all municipal offices in achieving equitable outcomes and services, support human rights and opportunities for everyone to achieve their full potential, work to resolve issues rooted in bias and discrimination through research, education, and interventions. And then last night, as we started talking about a new department, I started to feel like, well, we've already, this council's already advocated for a new department around some of what we're talking about. Um, what just jogs me to think that maybe I would share this today is what you just said about how sometimes the, the, the issues of race, uh, racial bias, the issues of bias here are difficult to study, right? They're, they're difficult where we can say, we, we know we have proof that the police are going on mental health calls. We know that there are uh, people with their trained expertise for this that, that are more specifically trained than a police officer. It's very easy. Like I said, two weeks ago, I think it's the low hanging fruit of, of our commission. Um, but proving a racial bias and how we want to change that is, is a little more difficult, um, you know, because we're, we're operating a lot on hearing stories, but, but we don't have like data where you do with the mental health response, you know, like this, because you're not going to get the police say, oh yeah, well, five times we, we looked at a black man and said, oh, we better keep an eye on this guy. You're never going to get those numbers to prove this. So how do you do it? So anyhow, this came to me and, and the, the idea that, that you know, there's an Office of Equity and Human Rights, I don't think it's out of the possibility to look at and say that that would oversee, um, you know, peer advocate, community liaisons, uh, you know, a, a, an emergency response unit to provide 24-hour service to mental health addiction, you know, whatever else we, we want to put into the thing. So I was thinking about that and, I, and I'm still working on the email, but I, but I now let the cat out of the bag a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that, I think it, it gets, yeah, I think we could meet, like if there was a broader community health department and then there was a role within that, that I think part of this is also making sure that that office has teeth. Um, and the ability, the power, the influence to actually do their job. And, you know, when departments don't retain, or it's not even, because sometimes it's not even hiring, right? You can hire diverse uh, people, but the, the, the culture within that department is really toxic and they leave. So it's, it's, you know, keeping people, making sure that they actually want to stay, that they're not just staying because it's the only job that they could get, um, you know, so they're, they're staying, but they're not happy. Um, they don't feel supported or included and things like that. But, and that, I don't know how the, I don't know how to write language <laughs> for that. Um, so, well, yeah, but... I mean, at the end of the day, I'm also, I'm with you and I'm with David and I don't 
necessarily care where funding comes as long as funding and change come. But at the same time, I do care a little bit. <laughs> um, but I, I think the other part is that I also want to make sure that it it's a whatever we propose is something that's feasible, yeah. um, and that we provide you know like like the like David had brought up um, and Booker strong recommendations, and I think part of that is going to be you know here's here's eight different pots of money <laughs> that we've identified. <laughs> you could identify more. Um, you know, whatever it is, but that, that we identify where funds could come from. Right. Or even that we may, I hate to say, oh, there should be more, there should be a larger study um, because that's not, <laughs> it just causes delays. Um, but reading like the Austin um, proposal for their, for theirs where they, um, I mean, they're proposing cutting a hundred million dollars from their police department. Like, I mean, so like there's orders of magnitude. The whole, the whole city of Northampton budget is a hundred million dollars. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, they went through pretty extensively, like all of the budget. Um, and I don't know all of the data. Do you mind if I share my screen? Just really. Not at all. Um, Go for it. All right. I'm just, this is the spreadsheet that they have. And again, I haven't, gone through all of this but this is their like we're going to cut the first hundred million dollars here's the excess training here's cadet funding cadet class I'm sorry, i just realized i have this look like way too large for <laughs> um but like they've gone through all of these different sort of scenarios and what ifs um and the spreadsheet is gigantic um when it comes to like how much infra like how much information is there what is the actual differential pay which we haven't looked at um, for shifts, um, what does that even mean? Um, the <laughs> sworn personnel where they'd wanna see cuts, how much that would be, um, which different things would, uh, so like all of these different things are, <laughs> and it keeps going, oh by the way. like it's not done anything near, like this is, this is huge. Um, oh my gosh. But, um, but thinking about, wouldn't it be great if there was someone that could do that for the entire city of Northampton um, to look at where reinvestment needs to happen? Um, and I say that and mostly because every time I go to a city council meeting, to another board meeting or another commission meeting um, from you know outside of this, I learn about new, like, new services, a new department, <laughs> new responsibilities for departments that I thought I knew <laughs> what they were doing. Um, but to really sort of like look at what the city's actually spent because we've been looking at what the city spends um, through the police department, but through all of the departments on these different things and how do you centralize those services to make them easier to access, but also to leverage larger, like, you know, when you have larger amounts of services that you can offer all in one place, it starts to cut down the cost to maintain those services as well. Um, so that was, that, just thinking about this and did everyone yeah. get the link to that report the austin report yeah it's from the austin justice coalition and i think i'm pretty yeah. sure yapping sent it um if not let me uh grab <laughs> that do, do, do. Uh, so that's their um their proposed cut that has that like spreadsheet and then there's like an explanation of how they got to these different things and some of the programs are things that like Northampton doesn't even have um I don't think um but they've got those and then this is one that I actually really like come back friend come on um uh, so that's the assessment for calls and that's something that I th I thought <laughs> since I've been staring at all of these calls and call logs it might be useful to try and do um, for Northampton, um, and I'll share my screen again just so everybody can kind of see these. Um, but what I thought was really useful was that they started to categorize, you know, the calls that come in. So instead of, um, you know, the the sheet that we have from the chief, which sort of lists out all of these things, 
um, to start like to start categorizing as best we can <laughs> what was a non-criminal call. So maybe something like the fire alarms or animal or animal inspection. Um, you know, animal uh, animal calls. I think in the Northampton PD is the largest call that they get. Right, that was like um, you know fourteen percent or fifteen percent of calls um, on like the first shift is directly for, is just for animal calls. But to start graphing it out, to really think about what <laughs> what we might take out, um, they use like the non-uniform crime report, and then they have like violent crime and property crime. Um, the uniform crime report. Um, I, I cheated and I found this one, which gives you the part one and part two, because um, I couldn't find it on the UCR site itself, which is a dense and nightmare thing to navigate. Um, but like, so manslaughter, uh, murder, forcible rape, I don't, uh, no force used victim under age of, I, I, I have to sort of, I don't think we have that as a category, um, um, but like things like assault, um, they specify aggravated assault, which is different than regular assault. Um, for us, assault is just one category. <laughs> Um, it, it, right, it probably is in the in the reporting, but of course, in the charging of the crimes, it's not. I mean, that's you know, if and when a, a, a charge is pressed, there's there's a difference between assault and aggravated assault, but not in the reporting, which is which is a little frustrating. Yeah, um, but to do our best to sort of just ag like aggregate some of these things, um, so that we can then sort of have a conversation about what. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for example, like, what does this mean for these, for these things that, that, you know, we could easily say don't need police intervention. I mean, we think we could make the argument for some of these not needing police intervention. Crisis response, yes, police intervention, no. Um, for a lot of these things, I think it, it becomes really easy. Um, so does that seem like something worth doing? Yeah. Wow. Well. I like it. I, I, I really I really do. It really being able to present something that is really digestible uh, for the for the public. Uh, that way, you know, we don't want to write a report that uh, ultimately only academics can can parse through and make meaning of, right? We want something that is visible to the community members who we are trying to out of like advocate services to. Right, so that they can see what we are advocating for and get on board, support it, push for it uh, in whatever means uh, they do, whether it be protests, whether it be showing up to city council and those things. And so I think putting the time into making the data that we collect and we present really digestible, I think is, is key to the success of um, the recommendations that we put forward. All right, then that is my, that will be my next project. Um, I'm still converting some of the documents into legible ones, but I should be done with that pretty soon. You know, honestly, uh, one of the things I noticed in the Brattleboro report was a call for, a, you know, kind of a different way of reporting some of the calls. I mean, that was one of the things that they were asking for because, you know, to the point that you're making here, we, you know, it's not really organized in an easy way to kind of decipher, um, you know, or to, or to categorize, I guess is probably the best way to put it really. Yeah, and that's, that's something that's in the, um, in the Austin uh, coalition recommendations too, is like, fix, the, fix it. There shouldn't be 300 different call types that <laughs> never get used and 10, per, like almost all of them are just with like 10% of the types. So like mm. fix those so that they're more descriptive and get rid of the ones that that you aren't using. Um, the only thing, and I think we've all said this before, is that we want to make sure that the recommendations aren't, you should spend more money on like a new reporting suit, a new reporting tool. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> use the one that you have effectively. Um, but that's its own, <laughs> that's its own thing. Um, all right. The, So um, going this back to really the, good. going back to the expenditures and the costs, though, um, just 
in general, one of the, like, again, just armchair, knowing that the chief has already told us that the, the call logs are not, even though the call logs are by call, arri call arrival time to clear time for an officer, that sometimes they don't actually report the time that they spend or it's not reported accurately or recorded accurately. Um, but just as a sort of armchair note, so if we took an officer, you know, being uh, an officer's pay, start the, the starting pay, or maybe we take the average pay, um, but they're only logging 17,000 some hundred hour, um, 1700, 17,000 uh, hours of call time. So, and that's for everything um, that they do. And so one thing we could do is still provide a rough estimate <laughs> um, of like, all right, your average salary for your officers is X, X per hour times the number of hours. So, you know, if, if we wanted to bring that back to the, to the general commission as part of the sort of, you know, what, what do the police do and what does it cost if we're talking about expenditures and, and, um, you know, that doesn't get to the training and all the other things, which I think at some point we should spend time on, especially since it's something that the city spends time on uh, and money on, <laughs> um, you know, for the officers that are spending between eight and 12,000 hours of training for that department in a year, um, right. which is almost the same amount of time that they're spending for, like act actively out on calls. Um, and even some of what those calls are, right? Like, because some of the traffic or radar and, you know, that's its own thing. But um, I think the other thing that we probably want to talk about when we talk about policies also effect, um, efficacy too. Um, so the, the police have been going out on calls. They've been spending money on this training. Um, but the use of force, it looks pretty consistent over the past few years, it's still disproportionately use of forces used against African-Americans or Blacks and um, Latinx people um, way higher than their population is. So if we're paying for trainings and we're sending officers to trainings, are we actually getting any return on that investment? Because the, the use of force incidents, incidences aren't going down um, maybe it's just that the police need those trainings to keep them that low and that they'd be higher without it, which is frightening to think about. <laughs> right. The, the crime rate is going down though. Yeah. The crime rate's going down, but, um, uh, if you look at the incident, um, incidents of force or use of force reports, uh, it's about 84 a year, which is not a huge number, but we're also a small city. Um, but 14, 14, 16% of those are African-Americans that are 2% of the population. Um, yeah, and maybe, you know, I was thinking about this number two, 2% 2 of our population, that's the Northampton population. Um, but certainly that doesn't mean um, that all of those uses of force were against a Northampton resident. So I, I actually took a peek at the at Massachusetts. Massachusetts is 7% black, right? But which is still half of the the rates, you know, just to, to understand that probably some of those people aren't necessarily from Northampton, they're here visiting or, or what have you. Uh, and, and all of a sudden you see that it, it's still, you know, more than double the, the population rate. Yeah. Right. So just thinking about all of those, like in terms of like what, what the expenditures are for a department, right? Because training is, you know, every, I think every department's going to need training, right? That's professional growth, right? You know, staying up to date or learning new techniques that come up in the field. Um, but thinking about if we're thinking a new department as well, if they're going to spend eight, eight thousand, twelve thousand hours, um, you know, on training as well, <laughs> um, like the police department, we just want to make sure that we're saying both, you know, for the police department that still exists, you know, for however long. Um, if you're going to do training, it, it needs to demonstrably be, you know, some, there needs to be some measurement there 
but also here's a standard for all departments. Um, and you could rec or recommend that there's a standard that gets created for departments, especially if it relates to um, diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings or things like that, or whatever, that there has to be a return, a demonstrable measurable return um, and an improvement. Right, because uh, a whole lot of what we've heard from reform is that, you know, they just need more sensitivity training and, you know, they need to be able to, like you said, demonstrably prove that those things are, are actually working, that we're actually getting what we pay for. Otherwise, we are creating a, a, a bigger cost sink, right? Something that we're just continue to throw money at. And because we throw money at it, we just continue to go, yeah, that's the solution. We just keep throwing money at it. Um, and of course, they're, they're, like you said, they're should be trainings. Every kind of industry has trainings. Even my brother, who's a barber, you know, had to go through X amount of hours of training before he was legally allowed to cut hair. Uh, and I'm sure that we will have um, some recommendation for that in place for our, um, hopefully for our peer-to-peer -peer response. And I mean, that's one of the nicer things about having that, having a peer response or something that's that's controlled by the city, that's funded by the city and that's stable, is that you can also start to offer things like professional development funds, um, which I mean, the, the police department does, right? Um, and I think um, most other departments allow for people to at least apply <laughs> for, for those funds um, and to pay for it just so that you can keep, you want, you want people to be the best <laughs> um, that they can be. And that takes time, learning, energy, um, and it does take training. So getting that on board um, as part of it as well, I think that's just really, because um, if I look in the budget, oh, where did it go? Come on, friend. Of course, I had it and then ran away from it. There we go. Um, uh, So the police department says that they spend $44,000, $45,000 a year, if we round up, it's $44,984,000 a year on training. Um, you know, if we're changing how, how that works, uh, if we're changing the, the scope, uh, you know, we might wanna say, all right, we want some of those funds to be diverted or we want equitable percentages of funds for this new department to also have training. Um, thinking about that. Um, the other thing that I think we might, you know, never mind, never mind. It's not related to this. Let's say focused. <laughs> um, <laughs> but just thinking about, um, yeah, I mean, like even the, even the things that the police department spends, there's, um, you know, the police, department itself is budgeted to spend money on dues and memberships. Um, so thinking about what, what that is. They also have, um, like as part of their operations and maintenance, they have more training and seminars as well, which I'm just noticing. So that might be a thing to look at. <laughs> yeah, the money, in, the money in the personnel services is paying the, paying the salary while they're training and the money in the OM is paying for the actual training. Thank you, that makes much more sense. I had, yeah, I, yeah, I remember asking that question too in, the, in June, yeah. Awesome. Um, so, I mean, that actually brings it up. It's about $100,000 a year in training for, for officers. And that's what it's budgeted out. I don't, I don't think we ever got the, I don't think we ever got the end of year reporting uh, for 2018. trying to remember yeah if we did i don't recall seeing it all right so that's something to check in on too talking about that that 100,000 that's almost that's <laughs> on the training alone that's almost a no that is a 20th of what 
I don't know what I'm saying. It's a fifth of what that other department that you were talking about earlier cost, Michael. The hundred thousand, yeah, the five hundred thousand for the. Uh, was it the God? I can't remember. I'm blanking today. Honestly, oh, yeah. at the end of this meeting, I would have been like an office, office of equity. equity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, that no, the health department. Yeah, the health yeah. department. Right, and yeah. it's. I mean, it's it's more than five times larger in terms of the number of uh, FTEs. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but. Yeah, that's that's a it's a, an awful lot of money. Yeah, so going back to you know making sure that we actually see a return on the investment that is these trainings, and if we don't, moving some of that cash away, reallocating it toward either trainings for these programs, the infrastructure, um, you know whatever it needs to be, I think is really important. Um, yeah, I think the the big thing for, and I know not everyone agrees with these things, but I think for us to get into the weeds a little bit of it, just to prepare um, both for the report, but also the council and the mayor to be able to like, look at the same information <laughs> and then go, oh yeah, that's that's that. Um, I think that's gonna be important because if we just say, well, you should just cut the funds or just take money from something else and, and put it in. But if we don't have like real this, yeah, I agree with you. This is the biggest challenge we face in terms of uh, reallocating the money is is making the case the, that that it can be moved, that the duties can be moved and that the money can be moved. It's the greatest challenge, absolutely. Um, Not to mention to what, to, to what extents and in what proportions. Uh, and when you're working with a, a deck of uncertain cards or not properly reported cards, it becomes a lot harder. And then you're making rough estimates and, and it looks more shaky and it's about really kind of selling that case. Mm. Yeah. Um, I will say sort of reported to or related to that. And I think this is something that we also probably, and this is, you know, maybe something that's also for the policies and services <laughs> for us to sort of tackle at the same time. Because I think we've been working with, you know, similar ideas, but if we're talking about like, I think we're the only group that's really brought up staffing levels, um, which I think is important to think about. Like how many people might we need? And I know that's a super rough, like <laughs> you know, how, how do you how do you guesstimate that? Um, you know, but if we're talking about contracting out or reaching out with all these other people, um, but also how many people do the how many officers do the do the Northampton or how many officers does the Northampton Police Department need? Um, we got the, when we asked that question pretty directly to the chief, uh, sort of how do you determine your staffing levels? It was, well, we want at least five officers on duty at all times. And, you know, if you look at the data, we're below the, either, this is a wording choice, we're either below <laughs> the national average or above the New England average or Northeast average. Um, depending on if you're looking at full-time employees or um, patrol officers. But what I think is important is that 10 years ago, Northampton had roughly the same population and it had fewer budgeted police officers. And we now have less crime. So I, it could, it could be phrased better, but I don't think that suddenly we're going to experience a wave of, of you know, unsafe conditions for the majority of the population um, related to just, you know, oh, there's not, <laughs> maybe there's three officers on duty at all times or four, whatever it is, or maybe we target so that you have more officers, like the, the police department can rearrange, like they have that power, at least from what we've read in the contracts, they can say, we're not going to have five officers on at you know midnight to seven or six fifty nine a.m. because there's not a lot of calls there. Right. We we get four times the amount of calls during the day. So that's where we want the majority of of whatever staff they have. That's up to them. <laughs> um, but I think it's important to sort of at least note that fewer officers has not made Northampton less safe. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, there's still 45 patrol officers working five shifts each every week. 
you know, um, and I get that, like the chief said, some are on vacation or have a day off or whatever. But I think if you just factor in five shifts per week each, it's 225 shifts. And if you think about it, three shifts a day times seven is 21 shifts a week. That's more than 10 uh, per. So when there's, when there's some where there's only five, that means there's others where maybe there's 15. Um, you know, just, just talking law of averages, you know, uh, just, just real simple math there and thinking about, you know, okay, so if three are on vacation, does that mean there are still 12? Uh, you know, and again, you have to think about weekends uh, being busier times. You have to think about like, like you just said, three to 11 is probably much busier than, than uh, 11 to seven, um, you know, and, and so that, that, right, the scheduling comes down to the, to the, how the department runs itself. But um, in terms of the number of, of shifts available, you know, it's, it's right now the city's making more than five, five officers available per shift. You know, it's just how you, how you place the pieces on the board then. Um, right. And I think a really important question to ask uh, while we're talking about staffing is like, who is making the hires, right? Who's in this position of power to kind of uh, determine who's on patrol, who's assigning shifts when, um, what are those people's records? And then you can take that even further to uh, these new departments that we're advocating for. It's just like, who's going to be in charge of, um, you know, hiring for and, and choosing to say who's qualified, who's not qualified, I think is also um, something that we should consider. And, and another thing, and I know that Council Labarge was just sort of saying this off the cuff, um, but, you know, in the, in the summer, you know, when it was, oh, why don't we just have a program to replace police officers? So if you lose a police officer, you hire a social worker. Um, we might change the language a little bit, <laughs> um, but you know when the when the police chief says, "Oh, we've we had six people resign," my brain immediately goes, "Well, we should have six people that are that are responding to those to the needs of the city, um, and the needs for safety. So we should hire meet just just in my brain immediately. So okay, fine, don't rehire six police officers. Let's start hiring six peer led responders." exactly because you, you've got that let's do that immediately <laughs> um earmark those funds immediately but I mean, it, then we have to really i mean part of this is going to be getting this department off the ground um which is going to take you know executive buy-in <laughs> and yeah not a small amount of of work at least from what i've what i've read and i'm not a master of reading some of these things but i'm sure there's stuff that i'm missing that's implied in terms of creating a new department and then actually structuring and funding it. Um, but we'll say like, here's, here's an idea of where, like, start off with six people <laughs> and have them, you know, working, again, thinking about where, where those calls might happen. You know, we can look at the logs and say, okay, here's where a lot of calls are happening. Maybe you want to respond to these first. Um, and then scaling up, um, you know, put more funds in, hire more people, establish this as something that's that's meaningful. Um, so, yeah. um, when, when when thinking about the future of um, Northampton policing in terms of the budget and in terms of you know wh what levels of of divesting and reinvesting to the community into the youth. Um, propose new organizations. I think it's really important that we stress um, kind of like a outcomes and data-driven pilot, right? Because then I think on the, the success of a pilot of these peer-led programs, we can then use that as evidence for further divestment and further investment in these programs, right? We're starting right now with 10%, but who's to say that um, we don't eventually see a cut of 50% or even 60% or more based off of the success of this initial peer-led um, kind of response, right? Because then we can move, we can uh, over like a plan of say like five years, move funds from police and maybe other aspects of the Northampton budget to these community-driven peer-led uh, institutions that will hopefully bring a lot of much needed services to the community 
uh, maybe reshape Northampton as a whole in the way that we see ourselves and the way that it takes this kind of humanitarian lens at really addressing the needs of the citizens here and the people who come and visit as well. I mean, I think one of the things that this has come that, that stands out for me is that I don't know if, <clears throat> sorry, I don't know if Northampton has ever done this, if there's ever been like a, like a dedicated needs assessment <laughs> for the city. Um, you know, and that's something that, that a lot of times people will do is a need assessment. You do a needs assessment to see what you need to do, where, you, where your gaps are and things like that. And I don't think that that's ever been done at the city level. And let, I'll be 100% honest, I don't even know if it's scalable and something that the city could take on effectively um, just because it's it's such a large population, um, but at the same time, and I'm, you know, just they're throwing out there. UMass is able to do a needs assessment, <laughs> and its population is relatively <laughs> close to Northampton's population, so it's possible. <laughs> um, but that but gets, to, yeah, you know, it it gets to you know, there's there's still a scale of who do, who's doing it, how are they doing it. How are people being reached and especially um, how are people being reached that are part of marginalized communities that might not respond or might not you know be easily reachable in the conventional methods to make sure you know, since we're identifying all these issues that are related to them but that's that's something that you can also do to say all right where do we need to scale up services um, and then that also lets you identify all right, which service providers do exist where might there be gaps? Where might there be problems? Um, you know, I've heard a lot of things through the sort of um, through different conversations with people that like, oh, ServiceNet is you know difficult to work with, or um, there's you know, people feel like maybe there's there's um, issues around service and race and all these other things. I don't know, um, but you know if that's the case, if you interview enough people and you start hearing that. It gives you a place to sort of say, okay, where can we improve that relationship? What what part, or you know, do we look for another partner? And if so, what are we looking for in partners? And that's one of the things that I think is important in adding accountability language, um, and finding ways that we could maybe do that for um, ways that we could at least suggest that to the city as well. Like, what is a like? what are those accountability structures that we want to see both within the city and also in anybody that the city reaches out to or contracts with? Um, and accountability could be, you know, accountability or <laughs> responsibility. Um, and maybe that's something that falls under diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that <laughs> someone else could refine it. Um, right. There are scholars that do that work. I don't think that I don't think we, we could write something perfect, but we could at least say that, you know, these are examples or this is something that's important to us to include too. You know, if we talk about who the city contracts with. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and you, there is a person that, that could that could do that and it's, it's a mayor. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in terms of, you know, trying to figure out how to do a, you know, a needs assessment. Um, and, and interesting, I mean, you know, maybe a new mayor will want to do that just to just to get their arms around the whole thing uh, or something similar anyways. Yeah. <clears throat> interesting. You always make me think, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I think that's a compliment. I'm going to take that as a compliment. It is a, it is a compliment. It is a, it is a compliment. I feel like I learn from you every time I I'm in your presence. Um, or at least I have to go and learn something. <laughs> <laughs> We're all in a process of learning. Yeah. Um, so, um, I was trying to think of, there was something else that someone said in the last meeting and I wrote it down and I don't know where I saved it. That was related to what we were. I've lost it. I'll, I'll remember like eleven at night. Eleven tonight. Um, but when we talk, um, is, there, is there anything else that we need to, to cover?
Oh, so the next item on the agenda um, has the, the staffing regulations and processes. I don't want to steal Josie's thunder. He's really the one that's supposed to, or just along. But I was thinking about one thing you said before about training that, um, because this has minimum requirements in law, I, I wondered about as we've did, we're just discussing training. Uh, does is there a training requirement in the law? To which I'm sure there is, right? I mean, there's got to be things that that police officers stay certified in and 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 so forth. So uh, that just popped into my head now as I saw that as the next item up. Yeah. Um, so there's the there's the police officer training. There's the academy that they have to go through. There's probationary time um, as well that the chief included as said there were 4,000 hours of probationary training, but I don't know if that was 4,000 hours of like the, the trainees spent with department officers or if that was the department officers mentoring somebody for that many hours or if it was some combination of the, of the two. Um, but in addition to that, we have the, the training that they, they say they go to, which is another 8,000 hours um it's unrelated to that part so it's unclear if that's mandatory or not um right but um in thinking in terms of comparable um time or comparable experiences there's you know if we're talking about peer led responses you know there are certification programs for those for those folks as well if we mm -hmm. to to add legitimacy to those um in different in different instances and, and ways absolutely <clears throat> right um not only that but in terms of what the city is actually legally responsible for in terms of what the the the, the contract says there's actually some pretty good stuff in there um for example the city has the ability to determine the organization of the department, the number of employees, the work function, and the technology to perform them, as well as determine the methods, means, and personnel by which the department operates, uh, operations are to be carried. So actually, uh, in terms of things that the city has control of, it seems like there, there's a pretty good deal. Yeah, I think, I, yeah, I think listening to that, Josie, it, it makes me feel like, you know, that's, I mean, that's right. That's what the city would control or what, you know, and any employer kind of would figure uh, out how to run their business that way, you know, in terms of how many people and how they do the job. And so that's really, yeah, that is, that's really good stuff to understand. Right. Um, I think the, the follow up though, and it might be a question for the chief, um, is just what trainings are mandated versus what trainings are optional um, that they're sending um, that they're sending officers to, if that's something that we want to explore, um, or do we want to leave it at this is what they're spending currently on all training. <laughs> um, and again, you need to think about the if I pull up the report, sorry, I'm gonna go dig for that the the chief <laughs> email, um, just to get the link. Isn't one of the other subcommittees having the chief the chief show up? Um, uh, four questions. Two of them are, but the those committees are writing their own questions. Um, you think we could ask them to, to ask one of ours? <laughs> I mean, my personal opinion, especially for these, where it's just, it's a, please give us this information. Sure. <laughs> sure. I, think I think they're, I think the other committees are imagining more of like a conversation. Um, this is like they're looking for, for nuance. And I think we're just looking for raw information. Sure. Um, so my personal preference is to just like, I'm asking for numbers, I want numbers back. Um, and I, as accurate as possible. So it's not like armchair, like, you know, what right. training do you have to send people to? Um, please like, give me give me the list of how many of how many trainings and how long those trainings are and how much you spent on them. Is for the mandatory ones, isn't something you can sort of conversationally <laughs> estimate. Right. 
Uh, I just want to address something really quick. It looks like we have a hand up in the participants bar. Um, so we did have public comment at the beginning of our meeting. The time is now ended. However, if you want to submit a public comment um, to us, you're more than welcome to do that uh, through, I believe, Noah. Um, you can send an email of what your public comment is be and then Noah will uh, forward that to all of us commissioners um, yeah so we are not really accepting public comment right now at the moment but thank you for your interest and again uh, I think if Noah if you could put your email in the chat for this person it seems as if they're they're on their phone um, I think that may be he'll guard yeah so yeah that's where I'm going to kind of leave it. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think Noah has already, um, Noah's already worked with them before. Sure, sure, sure. Um, yeah, so the, the chief's exact language was, uh, in 2019, field training officers, parentheses, patrol officers, provided 4,442 of field training hours <laughs> to probationary officers. This occurs during regular patrol hours. Um, you know, so thinking, um, what, what, does that, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, what does that mean? Deciphering that, that sentence um, in relation to training, does that mean that if we're if we're thinking about what the department's spending on training, if we if we care about getting to that, you know, we could we could leave it at between eight thousand and twelve thousand hours, right? So if we include that in training that that officers are receiving, um, it also gets to sort of what counts as a training is like an in-house training or um, in the the list of training. Some of them were like the city hall like new employee <laughs> trainings and things like those. I think are a little less you know, those are less job specific to policing. Um, you know, is that a training that we would consider if we're if we're looking at counting? And is that something that's in that um, in the budget in that line item of, you know, 80 or $65,000? Uh, is that something that the the department is paying to the city in one of those weird relationships where like the city charges, even though it's not really a charge? Um, it's weird. I don't. I wouldn't imagine so, <laughs> but you know, different bureaucracies do do things differently, and I don't. I don't know the relationship here. Yeah. Right. I mean, I've been through the the city training, but it wasn't um, because I'm not paid hourly. I don't. I don't know that it's accounted for that way. But there's an ethics training, and then there's some other other stuff you have to do too. But. Yeah. Mm. And. So <clears throat> this is, it feels every, every week we, we converse, it feels like <laughs> there's more and more that we want uh, to be clarified or done uh, before our, our initial charge is over. <laughs> and it always seems like such a daunting task. I mean, it, I mean, what we've been charged with is, um, but kind of bringing it to, uh, so I feel like working in these subcommittees has been really, really helpful um, for a lot of what we've done. But as we're nearing the end, I feel like there needs to be kind of more inter um, subcommittee, you know, cooperation in order to answer some of these more difficult questions. Um, Cause we can, we, can, we can sit here and talk about how you know, we need to set aside a certain portion of the budget for these peer-led programs, but if we don't know exactly what's being recommended by the other subcommittee or, you know, what services in their um, kind of initial research they've determined to be um, the services we want to move away, then it becomes kind of difficult to, to, to move cohesively. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that's the... The, one of the reasons why we have those sort of that 
the idea of like discussing specific recommendations at right. the full meetings to try and nail some of these down. I think the for us, we are like the reactive subcommittee. <laughs> in right. a lot of ways. Like, um, but at the same time, really digging into these and understanding like some of the nuances of what goes where and how. Um, like and the work that we've done, even though a lot of it has been like, huh, that's a weird set of words. What does that mean in that order? Um, right. Like that, th those sort of those sort of things where we dig at these or where you know we're sort of trying to parse out what <laughs> what things are when they go unmeasured um, is going to help in those conversations because then you know when somebody says, oh well, what is the what is the city spending now? Um, or, you know, at some point, uh, you know, if we talk about like scheduled reductions in a budget, um, you know, do we talk about percentages or do we talk about, um, do we talk about percentages or do we talk about dollar amounts? Right. Because that has a difference in impact because 10% a year reduction, you know, after a couple of years means significantly less than a set dollar amount. Um, right to that other department that might be scaling up and might need more, right? So thinking about those sort of things, mm -hmm. um, but also thinking about some of the things like um, to say uh, that we can look back at the contracts. So if we say, all right, we do wanna introduce, you know, we want a new department, whatever, uh, whatever else comes with that, whatever it's, it's gonna have. And then we want a, um, you know, we do want a reduction what can the police do as a, you know, in terms of management and personnel management to avoid, you know, losing officers if that's the concern um, in a set time, right? So, you know, the, the department can restructure shifts, they could spend less in vehicles, more in personnel, or they could, you know, start to do some of those reductions. They could look at the processes, like they have that power. And we want to say like, all right, in the contract, in your contract with the union and your employees, you right. have X, Y, and Z power as the mayor and the chief um, in terms of controlling that budget and how it's allocated. You know, to just put it out there is you've got the power. <laughs> um, right. Like the city have looked at, you know, um, just sort of think like they could have done impact bargaining before uh, with the union and done things like salary uh, salary freezes, which they've done in the past when there's been a budget shortfall to protect jobs. So the fact that they didn't engage in it this time and then complained about losing people of color and women, it's like, well, did you, like, why? <laughs> if you have that process available, but, you know, as a reminder, you have that power um, to re-engage <laughs> the union um, and to say, you know, yes, there's a, um, you know, yes, you are, uh, you, the union agreement does prioritize um, uh, time in the, in the department, right, uh, seniority, uh, but maybe you want to explore adding clauses in that allow for uh, seniority with, you know, no allegations of misconduct or <laughs> like, you know, so you're, you're not doing exactly what the chief has complained about, which is keeping the you know, um, older, whiter, and more aggressive police officers, right? That was that was the concern, right? These new officers right. are young and diverse, and they're going to bring all these new uh, models of policing. Not 100% convinced <laughs> that that's a substantiated claim, um, but the, the implication is that we have these old officers, some of them are um, and have had, you know, all sorts of different um, allegations. They've had court cases, um, some of them they've won, some they've lost, some they won, but then the union fought, or some they lost, and then the union fought, and then the city caved, but didn't. No one admitted guilt or or um, innocence. <laughs> I'm not sure how to read some of those addendums to different misconduct allegations, um, where it's like the city agrees to no punishment, but it also doesn't agree that the officer involved was innocent, um, and so like, you know, if you if you've got an officer that's a problem. That's kind of scary that they're in that position, but all right, what can you change in this contract? What language can you add that says, yeah, we want to respect seniority. We want to respect uh, if you've been here a long time that, you know, you, you're not necessarily the first to go, but if 
you're also not following the policies <laughs> that the department has set forth, maybe you don't get to stay. <laughs> <laughs> or you don't get to stay in the same way um, that preference is given to officers who have no misconduct. Um, you know, but that, and that's thinking, you know, long-term because at the end of the day, these are, uh, police officers are people that have families. They have some ties to, if not our community in Northampton specifically, to that community broadly. So, you know, you want to give them a chance. You know, if, if the department is going to be reducing its size, you want to give them a chance to find other employment. Um, I think another option would be and since the chief pointed out that so many of their officers have degrees outside of criminal justice, um, you know, if you have interest in working with these populations that the, that the police do work with now, if there's interest and you wanna work with them in a new paradigm that, that preferences those individuals and their agency and their autonomy and their humanity, uh, and you wanna follow the rules of a peer led response system, you could apply for a job there, you could apply to be a firefighter, you could apply to be, you know, a number of the other, there are other positions within the city too, because that's something to think about. Um, you know, but maybe it's just, you don't walk around with weapons. Um, right. And the, the focus of the job is hopefully more um, towards being proactive and helping rather than reactive and punitive. Mm. Right. <laughs> But all that's to say that, like, actually understanding all of these different, like, these line items, um, uh, now that I've sort of dug in, like, the career incentives, which is really the Quinn, uh, the Quinn bill. Um, so Northampton opted in at some point to the Quinn bill, um, but we could opt out as well, right? So you could say, no, we don't want to do pay increases for officers, um, right? So that's, that's something that the city could investigate. Um, is that ideal? Not, not necessarily, um, but that is $500,000 <laughs> worth of money. Um, that's the career incentives. Um, there's also the longevity, which is, you know, some, some more money. Um, there's the, um, the, uh, the city of Austin included this, but like, what are the situations in which you might want to perform a hiring freeze? Um, and the Northampton Police Department had a hiring freeze in 2010, right? That was in their budget was a hiring freeze or a salary freeze. Um, so if you're talking about a shrinking budget, but maintaining your personnel, because you're really concerned about that, that's, th there are other avenues that we can highlight um, as this other department sort of gets up off the ground. I'm right. Sure to take. No, those are, those should absolutely uh, be put into the our final report. Um, like the tools that Northampton has available to it in order to really make sure that this alternative um, is able to thrive and isn't just you know uh, what's 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 the saying like uh, killed in the cradle. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, and that that is a that is a real concern because if you know, if we say, oh, we're going to do a pilot and we, re or we recommend a pilot and here's how to run it, or even, you know, we recommend here's a program and here's how to fund it, whatever it is, if it's done, but it's not funded well, if it's not staffed well, if it's, if there are metrics, but they're not observable and achievable, <laughs> you know, you say, oh, well, this failed, let's go right back to the original. Right. And, you know, we can, I think, hopefully guide the city towards, you know, establishing something that is forward thinking, that is, um, you know, it might even be, you know, one of the first city <laughs> city departments um, to exist that, that is accountable to the people that it serves um, directly and, and meaningfully and beyond in ways um, that's just like, oh, well, if you don't like it, you can vote for a change in elected leaders. Not to say that elected leaders aren't useful, um, but the relationship between gov a government, um, the relationship between a city government and a service provider or a department within that, and the relationship between the department and the people that it serves is different. Um, and so thinking about ways to include that, that accountability and, you know, 
gonna say maybe as a model for other 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 places as well, but at least to have that as part of this. But that it's well funded, that it's organized, that the expectations are reasonable um, as a pilot as well. I think that's and you know reasonable expectations depend on what we are expecting the pilot to do and what we're willing to invest. Um, but to be reasonable there, to be um, not jumping the gun in terms of expecting overnight, you know, June 1st or sorry, July 1st, it's not like there's going to be no police department and a brand new staff that's ready to go and take over every crisis response. Right. Right. Uh, as nice as that may be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I would also love radical, magical change, but um, I think it takes us. I think it takes something drastically different. Um, there's one other part to think of, um, and I want to recognize that the Northampton Abolition now released their demands. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, yeah. Some of those things are, are, you know, some of the things are things that we've already talked about quite a bit and extensively, but then some of them are much broader and maybe more aggressive than whatever happened. But I think it's important to include them as well to say, uh, you know, there's a 50% budget cut that's being demanded um, of the police department. Um, and to give space to that, um, I'll be honest, and I know it's being recorded, so I'm stuck with it, but I'll say it. I don't think 50% is going to happen. Um, but one thing that I do appreciate is that if somebody's demanding 50% and you're demanding 20%, that 20% suddenly seems a lot more reasonable um, <laughs> in terms of, in terms of, you know, if, if the look, if, you know, the mayor or the city council or whoever's in charge at some point is looking at like places of compromise, um, you know, and I think that that's one thing that people have noted is that you know, anything that we recommend that there's going to be compromises throughout it. Right. Right. Um, but, you know, to acknowledge that we are not the extreme in making this recommendation. There are other departments that are going much further um, and there are groups that are demanding much more um, and, and at, a, at a much more rapid timeline um, then that, that becomes the reasonable thing to do. <laughs> right, which is something that I've advocated for during the general commissions that like we have to advocate and push for these more radical, these more large and sweeping changes because we know full well that this commission has no real teeth to it and everything is going to be uh, um, compromised down. And so if we, if we shoot ourselves in the foot by trying to seem like as uh, like as like lean and well-oiled the small change, then we're going to get even less than that, even less than what we asked for. Uh, but thinking about Northampton as a, as, a, as a city, you know, with everything that it has going for it, I think Northampton is well poised to be the city in Massachusetts that kind of leads this kind of initiative. Because if we don't, who else will, right? Um, there's a lot of reasons why I believe that, but you know, in terms of uh, other cities or municipalities with maybe smaller town budgets, they I don't think that they have the or can drum up the same type of support that we have here in Northampton to create uh, and, um, these new institutions, these new peer led programs. So if we don't do it, I don't think I don't think it'll happen for a while. And if we can prove here that it is worth doing in the rest of the state, then I think that's that's something to push for. Josie, just to head us up, you, you switched over and got real tinny there for a second. That's a, that's a shock. I don't know. Um, I'll try to fix it, but I don't know if you want to do what I can do. <laughs> just, just a heads up. So I might ask you to ask you to repeat some things. Um, do you want like right now? Do you want me to repeat what I just said? Uh, what? <laughs> So yeah. can you, I didn't hear what you just said a second ago. Yeah. Um, 
while while Josie's getting back in, um, I think one of the things, and now I can't remember which city it was, but there was a city in Massachusetts that cut their police budget by 25%. Um, you know, and to say we are we were not the most aggressive at 10%. <laughs> um, right. You know, other places have done this and found ways to make it work. Um, and in theory, we might be able to as well. Um, or not in theory. I, in practice, in all practical terms, I think we very much could, and we we've already outlined a lot of them. All right, I'm back. Is this better? Yeah, yeah it's better. Oh, okay, great, great, great. Do what? What did y'all miss in terms of what I said? <laughs> um, I think, um, I had heard like that you um, so it was compromises, um, are going to happen. So we have to be aggressive. Yep. Um, yeah, you said like that. I wow. <laughs> it's okay. I, this is my twelfth hour of being like on and in front of a screen, so I'm with you. Mm -hmm. All right. So yeah. So what I was saying is that that we I think it's really important that we push for these broad and, and drastic changes because we know full well this commission doesn't have any like real teeth, and so these things are going to be compromised downward uh, or less than right. Uh, on top of that, I think Northampton uh, is more poised than most if, if any city in, in Massachusetts to make these kinds of changes. There are other municipalities that don't have the leeway or the, or the local support for these changes. And if we can prove here that these pilot programs work, then we can change the way that policing in the state of Massachusetts and maybe even the country writ large alongside all the other cities like Austin and Brattleboro are doing. Um, you know, there isn't data for this kind of, this kind of shift. Right, and so it'd be really important to be the municipality that does that data, that does that work, so that it can be a point of reference for other places, so we can see actual systemic change. And yeah. that, and I think that's a really noble reason to follow through and make these these demands, these these big cuts, uh, per se, our reinvestments, really. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's the that's the thing. Like, so that you know. There are other towns that made bigger cuts than than we did, right? So in Massachusetts, there was a, I, it was a surprising city or town, and now I can't remember what it was. I will dig and find out. But they made a twenty five percent budget cut, um, and you know, obviously, it's not been a big deal because that city's not up in flames, uh, and we aren't hearing about it every day. <laughs> um, so there are obvious that there's we can show that that, that works. Um, thinking about like going back to where we were, the population hasn't really changed for Northampton in the past decade. Um, our crime rates have gone down, but I think you could easily, you know, we look at the budgets and you know the police budget is 40% higher than it was a decade ago. Um, the, as far as I know, the, the inflation rate isn't, hasn't hit 40% higher. <laughs> um, it is higher. I don't know exactly what that is, and I don't. And I think one of the things that we could do is track what those costs were. I can almost guarantee that a lot of it was expanding the department, right? So the in the last one, they they'd asked for and they wanted forty seven patrol officers. Um, you know, and a decade ago it was thirty. I believe it was thirty three, thirty four, which is what they said they sort of have now. <laughs> anyway, um, in terms of active patrol, and so thinking about, I guess for me, it's just thinking about what what return on investment is there and how do you show that? Um, or how does how does the police advocate, how does the police department advocate for that and show that it's been, you know, meaningfully effect, effective? Um, honestly, I think that you're gonna find out that it's not. <laughs> um, but one thing that's important is thinking about what that process is so that the new departments that we, or the new department, if we recommend a new department or whoever's gonna be taking over those responsibilities, um, they can also look towards what, what's the budgeting process, what's the appropriate amount and you know, realistically tying that to service levels. How many people, how many, uh, how many people do you need? How many people are you gonna see? What do you need to actually serve them? Um, because the more questions that we get, the more the answer is just sort of like, well, it's just tradition that we just, request an amount of money, we request an increase in a budget, we request 
um, more and more without really looking at what needs are being met um, and tying that to something measurable. Um, and so that puts us into where we are now, where it's really hard to ask the question meaningfully, you know, what do you need, right? So we're going off what the chief gave us as the, the dispatch um, analysis of 17,000 hours-ish, there's, there's more, um, but saying like, oh, but there's also giant gaps in that. We don't actually, but it was maybe more, maybe less, unclear. <laughs> um, you know, and like things aren't coded well and you can only code for one thing. So maybe, you know, a building or property check was actually a building and property check that turned into an auto crime, but you can only have one. Um, <laughs> so it just, I think it's just that we have to be really, I think we should be really careful in terms of what we, what we put out, but also in terms of what we expect. Um, so if, if we're going to say there should be a pilot or we leave that open, we need to specify what objective or what measurable objectives we have or would have, or, you know, a, a process for defining those um, for the group that runs it. Right. Yeah, that's fair. Um, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I agree. Um, I don't actually have the agenda up, and I probably should. I have it up, but my, I'm on my uh, cell phone for the audio, and then my screen on my laptop keeps shutting off. Uh, the, the agenda, so we were just talking about staffing regulations process, uh, contractual obligations when including staffing levels, measures across department services, i.e. peer responders. Um, yeah, I mean, I think part of that also goes into, like like you said, defining what, like, what the pilot looks like, like what is a measure of success. In my mind, it's comparable usage, right, by the community for the things, for the um, kind of responsibilities that we've now taken away from policing to have those peer responders do. Um, and also, uh, I'm sure there are, there are many other kind of avenues for measuring success outside of that. But initially, in my brain, that's the first one, right? We want to see comparable levels of, of, of usage as well as hopefully more. Hopefully, people feel more comfortable to seek out these services uh, when they once didn't because of the, the fear of armed intervention, right? That way, we know that we are actually... Uh, adhering to the needs of the community. Yeah. Um, one of the things that, so just the thinking about like the the staff and looking at the, what's on the agenda, at, you know, in terms of departments and services, you know, i.e. peer responders, um, thinking about how we fund or staff those, a lot of the peer response right now that I've heard about is either just all nonprofit um, and no real relationship to the city in some ways, um, or it's all volunteer with no relationship. And a lot of it is, um, it, it's a lot of um, sort of annual or triennial contracts <laughs> um, and grants. Um, and so one of the things, so we, I mean, they, I think if we're, you know, depending on what gets, it's sort of proposed at the um, at the general commission meeting. We have a couple different you know we can bring up that we've already talked about different funding level or different funding methods. So one would be having it just within the department uh, within a department, right? Uh, and the department provides those services. But if there was a group that was outside of the city um, that was still doing those peer responses, um, you know we have a history of contracting um, with different groups. Um, it does, you know, it might be that we explore longer term contracts um, just because it is really precarious to be in a position where you're offering services, but every three years, you don't know if you're suddenly going to not have that, <laughs> right. that space. Um, 
but thinking about ways to bolster that, um, to add accountability into those contracts. Um, and I think they can do it. And the other thing to think about, and this is um, what Lois was looking at as well, um, and had brought up was just the Arts Council gives yeah. grants um, and does those sort of micro grant options. And so what would, um, is that another avenue now that's not replacing and it's sort of a, it's not an ideal situation when you're talking about something that was in, or could have been institutionalized, but in terms of pilots, in terms of people who have new ideas that identify new problems, um, because then if you have a system for micro grants, you can address those newer problems as they're starting really quickly and do a quick, a quick pivot with a pilot with a micro grant and then expand that if it's successful. Mm -hmm. um, which I don't think that the city does a lot right now. I could be wrong because I'm learning more every day <laughs> um, in every meeting that I go to, but um, that, that might also be, you know, even if it's not fully, even if it's not, if it's like the department that we propose is the one that administers part of that fund. Um, so you have, you know, X amount of dollars, you know, it's, you know, 500, $1,000 for a project. Um, and what can you do? Um, and that might even open up some of the things that we have partnerships with, with um, other institutions and what they could do. Um, so thinking about like MANA, um, like the soup kitchen, if, if there was suddenly a place where they had access to say, hey, try something new to reach more people, um, <laughs> you know, here's, here's a set amount, you know, it doesn't have to be huge, but it could be, meet, you know, small amounts could be meaningful for small projects. Right. Um, so thinking about that relationship too. So maybe it's not, um, so maybe there's a new intervention method, um, you know, for substance use that someone wants to, to bring to Northampton. Um, you know, uh, so thinking about like, um, Jess Tilly, who's spoken at the alternatives, um, subcommittee meetings and like, what could they do? Um, you know, they're, they have a very specific set of, of concerns that they're addressing, but you know, they're doing sort of overdose, um, overdose um, and substance use. And what could they do with, with the set of funds, you know, a smaller set of funds that they wanted to branch out or they wanted to try some new intervention method. The city could still support that peer, peer response, <laughs> you know, not necessarily taking on the responsibility for that department, but finding another way to intervene too. Just thinking about the different methods that are available, and I think we've gone through most of them. But just right. bring them back up. Yeah. The um. Yeah. Just need to step away for one second. Sure. Yeah. There's just so much to think about and so much to parse through. Yeah, you, you, you said that before, and it does feel like there's so much to learn here that yeah. it does seem like every time we're here, we're, we're, we're talking about, oh, what about this? What about this? And in the meantime, we're 43 days away from the final report being due. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, but I think that we talked about this a little bit in the full committee the other day that, that, that there may be a case to be made for, you know, uh, not necessarily extending this version of the Northampton Police Review Commission, but but as part of our recommendations, suggesting some sort of follow up or continued work. I think I think that's a good idea, especially so much. If if, if the if the city does end up going through with a pilot on a peer led program, I think some sort of community input is well needed, is is well welcomed, um, as well as continuing to see how the budget cut has affected, has uh, meaningfully affected, um, you know, the police's capability of doing less uh, now that those responsibilities have been shifted over. Uh, again, this is ideal what, what if the, if the um, you know, if the city actually falls through on um, our recommendations. Real quick, this is a side note, but, uh, Dan, I have that same water bottle. People have been talking about it, but like I have the same one. <laughs> just water bottle, please. Oh, it just has a sticker on it too. 
I was I was just I can't so believe the people talking about your water bottle. But I have to do one. You just got to show it off more. That's all. Right. <laughs> no, sometimes I'm pacing around. I don't want people to see the inside of my room as I'm in the process of moving. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I think related to all of that is that that not to rehash because we just said this, but that a lot of what we've done is sort of the groundwork and it's, yeah. it's the foundation. So we're pretty well poised to be able to respond to, you know, questions about where money comes from or where it goes or how it's labeled. Um, so that in the larger, in the larger meetings, when someone brings that up now, we can, we can say, yeah, let's talk a little bit about the, the down and dirty part. <laughs> um, right. right. You know, cause that's, that's what a lot of this has just been, has been, at least for me, has been sort of figuring out what, what does this mean in this context? Or, you know, at least asking the question or being ready to ask the question, like, what does this mean? Now that we've tried to parse it out, tried to track it down and can't, <laughs> can't go any further. Um, right. It's so frustrating. It's a, it, uh, it still boggles my mind that an institution has been allowed to run for so long with very little accountability and record keeping when we're dealing with uh, like a really intrinsic part of the way that our society operates, right? Keeping track of, of, of quote unquote crime or criminal like behavior, uh, interactions that may lead in possible charges, pulling of resources out of communities through the incarceration of peoples and all of it is just like yeah we did it but like oh, we don't know how long we did it for or what the impact of it was is just is ludicrous to me that, the, that these accountability measures have not been implemented in, in a rigorous and kind of transparent way yeah yeah and I mean I think the it's just part of it's just the history of policing, you know, but yeah. nationally, like that's, that's been the case that those, those types of, you know, those the types of organizations, institutions that handle these things have had sort of carte blanche. Um, and now, you know, it, it I don't want to say it's like a reckoning, <laughs> um, but there, there's a recognition at least um, that, that that system and the way that it functions isn't ideal, but even that peering into it, it becomes its own sort of arduous journey. And that, you know, we're we're doing the we're doing some of the work to figure out what happens behind that that curtain. Yeah. Um, like the iron curtain, if you will. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I guess still related to that. Um, the contractual obligations. Um, I just want to go back to it. I haven't found anything in the police union contracts. And I did like a quick sort of like word search <laughs> um, in Massachusetts general law. Um, just looking at like the Massachusetts general law. Mm -hmm. Didn't find anything that relates to um, like legal requirements to staffing levels so i think it really does end up being just at, at the discretion of the of the city of yeah the management of the department so the the chief and the city um by by that definition this is just like a thought experiment does that mean that the city could deem zero police if it wanted to I think I think there are some. I mean, they're they're much obviously the very small towns that don't that the state police handle everything in the town. You know, they respond to any emergencies. I mean, we live on a pretty busy road here, and you know, a lot of the smaller towns are north of here. In the you know state police stations on Hatfield Street, which is just this way, we see a lot of state state police cars going by with yeah. lights on. I think responding to to calls that are you know pretty far away, really, and into some of the very small small towns uh, north of here. Right. And, and they even, even the state police were in Northampton last week when there was the fire on Pleasant Street, uh, kind of, you know, lending aid to Northampton because we had five police officers on and needed just another couple to help direct traffic and get people out of the building and stuff. So the state police did 
kind of co-respond to that with the Northampton police. So th that support is there for cities and towns through the state police as well. Yeah, and that, that actually brings up one of the, uh, you know, sort of one of the issues that we want to think about is that if we move to these uh, peer-led responses and unarmed and outside of the police department responses, but um, in other instances, the state police, and this is, you know, different country, or sorry, good Lord, different states across the country um, where a city has said we no longer want a police department or we're going to reduce our police department um, state police have sort of stepped in and said oh we'll you know we'll step in so you can maintain the the same number of officers um, I think our concern is that we don't necessarily want the state police to come in and then suddenly handle those things. We still want peer-led response that's community-based. <laughs> um, so thinking about how to also ensure that that relationship doesn't happen. Uh -huh. um, or at least it doesn't function in the same, the same way where it's suddenly the police, the state police are taking over for the local police because we don't, we don't necessarily want that. We want something else to be taking over. And the state police, uh, the state police are still going to be there, right? Like Northampton can't say no state police. <laughs> right. You know, those, those things are above us. But what we can do is sort of say when, when we might reach out to them, you know, or we can recommend the, and I don't think that, there, I mean, there's not like a contract, um, but to formalize those relationships so that if the state police are needed for an emergency, um, you know, that the alternatives to the alternatives no the policies and services they had brought up you know what happens if there's like an insurrection like there was in dc and city hall um and i'm not sure why <laughs> because that's something that's really not going to happen but even if there was you know like no local police department is staffed for that or prepared for that that that's why it, even in dc they wanted to call in the national guard that's that's what that function is that's outside of a, a local police department right you know, to, to formalize okay fine if there's an insurrection fine state police can come um but if there's just you know somebody's asleep on the street we don't want state police if there's some if there's drug use we don't want state police right you know and if there's you know maybe there's a <laughs> you know like whatever 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 emergency scenario comes up um there's an insurgency and the state or the city hall has been taken by um you know rampaging trump supporters um or proud state. boys yeah the oath keepers proud boys whatever the, the police could come um and the state police could respond to that right or in theory the national guard should be responding to that um you know in terms of of insurrection but um but really thinking I love, about that. i love that they went there <laughs> i love that they went there that that you know i mean it is it's such a such a significant thing that happens in our you know public and all of a sudden we're discussing it here about northampton city hall was, <laughs> you know i don't want to make light of it but it is it is kind of i think to your point in not there there's probably not too many police departments in america that could could handle that without some support. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so those relationships, but maybe thinking about different ways that we could formalize those relationships. Mm -hmm. um, in, unless, I mean, they might already be formalized and I don't know, I, I haven't found anything that says that they are, um, you know, other than, you know, in terms of like this, like the state can charge for the, the state police presence um, or not, they have, they have sort of discretion. <laughs> um, in whether or not they charge a, a municipality for the state police presence. Um, yeah, I think I think if uh, if like a another town uh, responds, then then you then you do. There's like a must pay uh, situation there. But if it's state police, it's there is some some. I don't know if it's an arrangement or a discretion or what it is. But yeah, I think that's true. And that does lead us to one other part again related to the sort of staffing um because Rachel Bromberg had brought up the idea of like a multiple municipality peer response um so if we sort of say well the police already do this <laughs> if other 
cities in the area wanted to contribute, um, you know, and have, if, if we have a pilot that's peer led response and we can, we can scale it up, um, you know, what relationships could be formed with other cities so that that could be extended. Um, so thinking like, um, you know, Hatfield, um, Waitley, like going, going north a little or going to East Hampton or something like that, thinking what are those relations? If, if we can take police from there <laughs> and our officers can go there, what about our peer responders? Um, you know, it's funny that you would say that, Dan, because I mentioned that I had been kind of studying the, the budget of the city, looking at the various departments. And when you get to the veterans budget, um, well, it's not necessarily called the Northampton Veterans Services. It's like Hampshire County Veterans Services because out, we, there is outreach there. 11 communities are banded together for veteran services here. So uh, I, I think you're on track with something there too that could be, you know, that could be cooperative uh, amongst the whole county or, or, or whatever and any other communities that wanna, that wanna be involved. Can I ask a really probing question? I'm not sure if you have the answer to this. Do you know the history of how that sort of ended up being a multi, multi-city or multi-local I, I don't. And you know, you know, it's really funny is um, because of all the uh, things going on with the Holyoke Soldiers Home right now and the funding for that, we were, we're looking into trying to get the veteran services uh, director into our city services meeting so we could ask him some questions about the soldiers home. And then I also was like, oh, what about the fact that we have 11 communities involved? How does the funding work? Like, does everyone cooperate and pool? How do, you know, how, I was curious about a lot of these different things. So I don't have that answer, but it is it is a question that I have too. <laughs> I think it's it's worth at least noting that that's something to explore. Oh, and let me just mention one other, which is uh, we also cooperate. The health department cooperates um, for contact tracing uh, with I think it's like thirteen different local communities, also kind of uh, supporting each other and creating contact tracing together. Uh, so there is um, let to you know just add that in. There's another there's another precedent. Of what you're talking about. All right, cool. It's just, it's one of those things thinking about like, cause that, that might change sort of what we, or at least it changes what we would recommend in terms of like staffing and, and scope, but also in terms of funding to say, you know, not all of the, not all of that fund, not all of those funds need to come from a particular, you know, we, we don't have to say we have to fund all of a new department with a 10% cut from the, <laughs> from the police department, um, especially because if we say 10% or 20% or whatever percent, um, you know, a 10% reduction one year, if that stays reduced, the next 10% is actually less dollar for dollar than the, the first. It's 9%, uh, correct? I, th I think that's yeah. how it eventually goes, right? Yeah. Um, so just, just thinking about <laughs> <laughs> just thinking about that like you know we could still say all right cool but if you know we we have some money uh it's going to staff this thing and then the next um you know the next iteration we still want to put more money towards it but you know we're also going to look for or we can we can recommend that they also look to other cities or other localities um and you'd have you know a year or 18 months or whatever time frame of information of you know data to show like, oh, look, just like in all these other places, this program has worked <laughs> right. uh, here, and, you know, let's expand it and, you know, gently say, all right, other municipality, maybe you need less police too, because now you have this group, um, you know, and have it be that domino effect um, as well. One, yeah, one other partner on that would mean everything, right? Just just one other would, would be, no, again, dominoes, like you just said. And you know maybe I'm I'm thinking about um, East Hampton. You know they're I mean they've been doing quite a bit of work. They've had a lot of activism um, and they've had you know a lot of different uh, engagements with the mayor <laughs> of East Hampton as well um, in terms of like reduction and improvements to um, to policing among other things as well um, to sort of get to like more more than just performative gestures and so maybe that would be another partner that's fairly large. I'm thinking about like in terms of population size where, where the other larger places that might wanna join in here. But this might also be attractive to places that are small. Um, you know, a peer responder is likely going to cost that 
that place less than a police officer, right? Yeah. Um, in terms, and they may of, be getting no support in that in these arenas at this time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, just thinking about that. Um, All right. Awesome. So, I don't know if uh, y'all want to continue the discussion, but it is seven o'clock. Um, my only thing would be, uh, I really quickly want to discuss when we want to meet next and um, potential uh, kind of general talking points aside from just general research and continuing the, the discussion in terms of what will go into the final uh, report. Um, some things um, that Dan has, you know, kind of alluded to is kind of focusing on the recommendations for allocation of previous budget um, cuts, such as the the, uh, the potable water access, uh, inside clean public bathrooms, and other things that we had advocated for earlier in the winter, um, and and thinking about our houses community, and then also, um, you know, things such as. Like what truly, like what are what are the going to be the the costs, um, the costs of creating a new department, which I think will be really really good after having our discussion, our general discussion with the rest of the commission. Yeah. Does the, do those two seem like uh, like pretty good, like focus points for next for next meeting? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, do we have? Do we want to meet next week or the following week? Or now that we're meeting every week in commission, I don't. I my my brain's all turned around because I don't know what when is what. <laughs> next week's next week's a, we're going to have two full commission meetings as well with the hearing, uh, right? Also, and it's a huge week because the other two subcommittees are bringing in the chief, which I'm sure uh, will be worth listening to. Um, mm -hmm. You know, even though we won't be asking the questions ourselves, it's, it should be interesting to 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 sure. observe the answers, anyways. Is, so, is that, yeah, is that I, a place to uh, a week off for us? Yeah, I don't think that's a bad idea. And then, yeah, and I think it gives us a place to sort of sit with what the recommendations were from, or what the recommendation discussion leads us away from on the from the full commission. Right. To react. Oh yeah, actually, that's a, I actually think that's a really great idea. Uh, both having the full commission meeting and then also the uh, the public hearing, I think, will really kind of put some things in perspective for us in terms of really thinking about what the cost of creating a new department is and the urgency of which uh, the allocation of the previous budget go to. So I think that- May I, I, think may I suggest you add that as a talking point as well, or a, 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 a point there that we take some time to discuss the public hearing if there was anything that impacts yeah, around absolutely. spending specifically, of course. Absolutely. All right. Do we have a particular date? That we're looking at for the following week so not next week but the following week yeah that's monday the 15th or wednesday the 17th i'm open both evenings i could do either one uh i personally would prefer what were the two options monday the 14th or monday the monday the 15th or wednesday the 17th monday or wednesday what do i prefer i think i prefer wednesday personally i can do both so if we decide on the Monday, that's fine too, but I would prefer the Wednesday. Um, could do that just as a note that the alternatives to policing subcommittees meeting at 7.30. Um, so just to make sure that Noah has a chance to- you know, Grab a snack between. Yeah. And can we do it? Yeah. Can we do five to seven again? Would five yeah. to seven on Wednesday work again? Yeah, that worked for me. All right. Sounds Great. good. Okay. So that is the 17th you said? Yep. All right, great, great, great. Sounds good. I will get that agenda to Noah as soon as possible. Does anyone want to make a motion of, of sorts that I? I will motion to adjourn. Second. All right, Noah, you want to count us off? Josie. Yes. Michael. Yes. Dan. Yes. Right. Awesome. Meeting is adjourned. Oh, thanks very much. Thanks very thanks much. So much. It was a great discussion again. Absolutely. Every week it's, it gets better and better. Bye, everybody. Bye -bye. Bye. See you soon.